Dictionaries are one of the most popular data types and hash tables are the data structure behind them. So let's see how they work. Welcome to this two-part series about hash tables. In this first part, I'm going to give an introduction to hash tables. I'm going to talk about the abstract data type dictionaries. I'm going to describe the basic principle behind hash tables and then at the end talk about how to choose a hash function. Then in the second part, we're going to talk about how to resolve collisions. So resolving collisions is a big challenge when uh, working with hash tables, but that's for later. So what do I mean by an abstract data type? An abstract data type simply describes the functionality that we would want to have from a data structure. So the abstract data type tells us what we want to have, and then the data structure tells us how we get it, how we implement the operations, how we store the data. Examples of abstract data types are stacks and queues and priority queues and, as we're going to see today, dictionaries. And examples for data structures are linked lists, arrays, and today, hash tables. So what is a dictionary? A dictionary is a very simple abstract data type. The key operation on dictionaries is searching. So we have a set of elements and each of them has an associated key, and we're going to assume that that's an integer key. And then the three operations that we want to have is search, insert, delete. So we want to be able to search an element by its key, and then we want to be able to insert and delete elements. And that's it. So as a running example, what I'm going to take is assume you have student data. So there the key is a student ID number, and then you would have additional data like name, email address, whatever. So when we program, we use dictionaries a lot. And in Python, a dictionary data type that is called dict, like dictionary, note that the key does not need to be an integer. And very often we use strings as keys. And dictionaries are indeed implemented using hash tables. I'm going to say more about that in the second video. There's also the data type set. Sets are simply dictionaries without associated data and as such are also implemented using hash tables. So why would you want to use a dictionary? So here I plotted the search time for a collection of elements, once stored in a list and once in a set. So you have the size, you have the time, and on a list, searching takes linear time. That is simply a linear search. So in the worst case, that's linear. While in a set or dictionary, you get a plot like this down here that looks constant. And indeed, we're going to see that it is, under suitable assumptions, constant time. So both of these allow to search lists and sets. But if you want to search a lot, you will not want to spend linear time. You will want to spend constant time. And then you will want to use a dictionary. And how can dictionaries be that fast? And that's what we're going to see today. So before we look at hash tables, let's see why we need a different data structure from the basic data structures that we already know. So for instance, why can't we use an array or why can't we use a sorted array? So how long does it take to search in an array? So to search in an array, it takes linear time as we just saw. Inserting and deleting, that's actually quite fast, assuming that we simply have place at the end to insert. Okay, deletions, we have to be a bit careful because if I delete an element, there will be a kind of a free spot. So I have to do something clever in terms of amortization, but then that could work in constant time. But searching definitely is too expensive. So that's why we cannot use arrays as dictionaries. How about sorted arrays? I mean, in sorted arrays, we have binary search. So we can indeed search fast. We can search in order log n time, which is fast enough, I would say. But there we have the problem of inserting and deleting. So inserting and deleting in a sorted array takes linear time because I have to insert somewhere in between. And then I also need to make space for that. And also if I delete, I will immediately want to delete it and then shift elements back. So both of this takes linear time. So how about linked lists? Linked lists will have similar issues, but let me have that in more detail on the next slide. What we're going to see today are hash tables. So those will nicely solve our problem here because all of the operations are constant time under suitable assumptions. So let's go back to the linked list. How long does searching take in a sorted linked list? 
So constant or a lock in or linear time. For a linked list, even if it's sorted, searching takes linear time because on a linked list I cannot do something like binary search. I have only the option of going through it from start to finish. So what have we seen so far? We're looking at the abstract data type dictionaries. In those you can search, insert and delete. In Python they are called dict or set if you only have the keys. Let's look at how they're implemented using hash tables. So what is a hash table? I'm going to start with something that is not quite a hash table. Hash tables generalize arrays and a very simple way to get a search structure or dictionary in an array is a direct address table. That's not quite a hash table yet, but that will be our starting point. So assume we have again this, let's say, student data. So we have the keys, the student IDs, and some associated data. And let's further assume that the keys are in a range between 0 and 1 million. So a very simple way to get an efficient uh, dictionary is to simply have an array of size 1 million or 1 million and 1, and in that store the data in such a way that if your student ID, for instance, is 2, then at position 2, I'm going to store your data. And that is called direct addressing because I directly take the key and use it as index in the array. So what's our general setting? We have a set of elements S, each having a unique integer key from a universe, 0 to m minus 1, and satellite data. And now we're going to store that in a table, so in an array of size m, so size of the universe. And at index i, I'm going to store the element with key i and its satellite data. And if i is not the key of an element, then I'm going to store none. So how efficient is that? How efficient is searching, inserting and deleting? How do I search? I get the key, I look into the table, takes constant time. Insert delete also, I can just write into the table or remove something from the table. Everything takes constant time. Perfect. What is the problem? The problem is the space requirement. No matter how many elements we have, we always use a space, the size of the universe. So the space that I'm going to use is O of M. Now why is that a problem? Let's again go back to the example of student IDs. Let's say the student IDs are nine digit numbers. That means we're going to make a table of that size. So we're going to use lots of memory and most of that memory will actually be just storing nuns. So if the universe is much larger than the entries that we're actually planning to store, then a direct address table is very inefficient in terms of the space usage. And very often, the set of keys will be much, much smaller than the universe. Often enough, we even don't really have a restriction on the universe, so we might have allow all integer numbers, which then, of course, would be too large to store. So how do we solve this problem? The solution are hash tables. So again, imagine you have these student ID numbers, which might be nine digits, but you expect a much smaller set of students. Now, the idea is then to also use a much smaller table. So let's say instead of nine digits, we use seven digits. Now, the problem is we can no longer use the ID numbers to access a table. So we have to derive a number from those nine digit numbers that gives us the index of an entry in this table. For instance, a very simple way of doing this would be to take the last seven digits. In this example, for instance, if I forget the first two digits, the remaining digits simply tell me I'm here in entry three. Or in this example, I take whatever number the last seven digits are. This comes at a cost, the cost being that if I have several IDs, even if those IDs were different, if I throw away the first two digits, they may want to use the same spot in the table. So that's called a collision, 
And if we use hash tables, we have to think about how to solve collisions. Now we're ready to state what a hash table is in general. We have keys from a universe of integers, 0 to big M minus 1, so size big M, and we want to store them in a hash table, so in an array of size small m, where small m is smaller, small m is much smaller than big M. And we're going to do so by using a hash function, and a hash function takes the universe, so where my keys are, and maps it to integers, so the range between 0 and small m minus 1. And then for a key, I'm going to use that hash function to decide into which slot to hash my key. So if h of k is i, then I'm going to store that key on position i. We will have to address two questions. Firstly, what is a good hash function? So we saw the example of taking the last seven digits, but is that actually a good idea? Secondly, we have to think about how to resolve collisions. So what happens if there's another element that wants to be stored at position i? How do I resolve that? Before we take a closer look at hash functions, let's have a quiz. This is actually more an exercise than a quiz. So the setting here is we have a hash table of size 16, so indices from 0 to 15. We want to insert these elements, h12 and so on, in this order. And the hash function that we're going to use is 3k plus 1 modulo 16. And the question is, when do we get our first collision? So to get you started, let's do the 8 together. So 3 times 8 plus 1, so that's 24 plus 1, 25. Now 25 modulo 16, so 25 is 16 plus 9. So 9 is the index where the 8 is going to go. And then do the same with 12, 40, 13 and see when the first collision happens. The correct answer is B, 40. So because 40, let's do that. 3 times 40 plus 1, that's 121. So now how often does 16 fit? 16 times uh, 7, that is, let me see, 70, 42, 112. So 121 modulo 16 is a difference of those two is 9, so that also wants to go to position 9, and that's our collision. So let's look at hash functions and what a good hash function is. We would like to distribute the keys from the universe as uniformly as possible over the hash table, and for that we would like to have a hash function that is as random as possible. And when we are going to resolve collisions and see how to resolve collisions, we will see more of a theoretical background why we actually want to have it as random as possible. But in principle, randomness gives us A, that the keys are nicely distributed, also B, that if there is some pattern hidden in the data, or not so hidden, that the randomness breaks that pattern. So that's the main condition, but of course we also want to have a hash function that is fast to compute. Now, if you spend more time computing the hash function than searching takes, that would defy the purpose. So let's take a look at what to avoid when designing a good hash function. And as an example, let's assume we are hashing for the symbol table of a compiler. So the keys here would be variable names. And let's say they consist of capital letters, small letters, and numbers like for instance here, i, i2, i3, temp1, temp2, whatever. And the idea, so a very simple way of hashing these would be to take the first two letters. So to take the first two letters, so how many options do we have? The alphabet has 26 letters. Uh, we have 26 capital letters, 26 small letters, plus 10 numbers. So we have 26 plus 26 plus 10 options per letter. So we get that squared. That is the size of my hash table. So now I would simply map all of the variables based on the first two letters. So what is the problem? The problem is that if I have many variables that start with the first two letters, then I'm creating lots and lots of clusters. So lots and lots of collisions simply because my hash function P 
picks up this pattern that is in the data. So what is a good hash function? We will want to address this question for the setting where the keys are integers, where the keys are natural numbers. So in the example that we just saw, we actually had as keys combinations of letters and numbers. So let's first think about how to make sure that we always have numbers as keys. So that's actually easy to achieve. If we have a string as a key, we simply map it to a number. And here's an example of how such a mapping might look like. The word here, up, so the Dutch word for monkey, it has three letters. Each letter has a so-called ASCII representation. So a representation as a number. And I can simply string up those numbers and that gives me a number for the string. And that I can use then for hashing. So this allows us to from now on think about hash functions that map natural numbers to positions in my hash table. Our first observation here is that we want to have a hash function that depends on all digits, all bits of the input. Because otherwise it's very easy to pick up patterns that are in the data. So here for instance, you could easily just pick up a specific letter if you ignore parts of the input. Let me show you some common ways to design hash functions. So the first and a very simple one is using the division method. So in its simplest form, we take the key and then to map it to uh, index in the table, we do modulo the table size. So for instance, if my table has size 1024 and my key is let's say 2058, so uh, 2 times m is 2048, so 2058 modulo m is 10. So 10 would be the index of where I map this key. If you use a division method in this way, avoid a table size that is a power of 2. Why is that the case? So assume m is 2 to the p. What does that mean if I do modulo m? It means I simply take the p least significant bits of the key. Now imagine the key came from transformation that we saw with the string. Then this simply means that I take a certain set of letters or parts of letters. So this you will want to avoid. So a good choice for M is for instance a prime number, ideally not too close to a power of two. So that's one way of getting a hash function. Another way to get a hash function is a multiplication method. So you take your number K, you multiply it with a number a between 0 and 1. So that will give you a decimal number. And what you do here, what I denote by modulo 1, is you take the fractional part. So the part behind the decimal point. So that is a number between 0 and 1, strictly smaller than 1. Now, if you multiply that now with m, you get a number between 0 and strictly below m. You round that down to the next integer, that gives you your index. The advantage of the multiplication method over the division method is that you don't have to think about what your m is. So it doesn't matter if m is a power of 2. So let's have a quiz about hash functions. The following, let's assume our universe are the numbers between 0 and 29, and we have a hash function of size 10. And you have to choose between these two hash functions which one would you pick? H1 being k mod 10 or H2 being k divided by 10 rounded down? The correct answer is A, H1 being k modulo 10 because in this way I map to every slot exactly three numbers. k divided by 10 actually maps everything to the first three slots, 0, 1, and 2. So that's a bad choice. Uh, better than that would have been k divide by 3. That would have nicely distributed the numbers again. But that was not an option here. So what have we seen in this video? We have seen dictionaries as abstract data types where we can search, insert, delete. They are available in Python as dict or as set. We have seen the principle of hash tables coming from direct address tables. And the challenges that we observed is that we need to have a good hash function. That's what we already discussed. And we need to be able to resolve collisions. That's what I'm going to show you in the next video. See you there.